I like to caution you guys. You know, I see in a lot of resurgence in wanting planers and things. How much are you really going to use your planer? Before I start on this side, we're ready to cut this side off. Uh, I want to say one thing. Just from my experience, guys, I see a lot of people's interest in planers coming around and, oh, planers are cool. And yeah, they are. They're also a little used machine. So before you go to the expense and trouble of finding one and restoring one, unless it's for restoration's sake, this one, you know, I rebuild all machines. This comes in very handy for me. But how many people do that? So I would just caution you to make sure you have the space to let it sit here for 99% of the time. You have the electricity and your body strength still good enough. I mean, well, you see what I'm having to do, you know, we went from a little size wrench for a bridge port, some, some manly tools. And this thing will work you out. By the end of the day, when I'm doing a lot of work, I'm beat. So, yes, they're great tools to have. I wouldn't do without one. But there will come a day when I can't pick up the tools or move them around. So, it'll have to go to somebody else. But at least it'll be working and restored. Okay. I got this sitting over there. We got to set the depth on it and get going. this spot right here you could have humps all over the place so start off to the edge and feed across and remember to bevel it As you're planing, always remember these bevels get reduced by cutting off the top surface. So always make sure you got enough bevel to avoid tear out.
Well, now we come to the roughing out of this space. I've gone ahead and set up my picture that I made a long time ago for doing this. Now, one time, Richard King had a person who was doing his castings that some of them weren't very good. They were putting steel drywall screws into the mix, I guess, to improve it. But they weren't melting all the way before they poured them. So I ran into about three or four that had cavities under here. They look good over here on the, on the face, but once I started cutting down into them, a little pinhole started to peel. Shoot, there were some big cavities in them. This one's not going to be so much because this one isn't very thick, so I'm hoping it's in really good shape. Now, that caster, when we brought it to his attention that there were problems, instead of focusing on the hole that was in the straight edge, he focused on my setup and said my setup was shitty. And... I said his casting was shitty, so. It's probably about the 200th straight edge I've done this way. And I keep telling people this. This machine can take a half inch off at a time. I mean, it is powerful. You can't stop this table when it starts going. This is a very expensive casting. This isn't a piece of raw stock. This is something that somebody's put a lot of money into and they have shipped it across the country to me. They bought it and it's almost finished. If I screw it up, I don't charge enough money to buy a new one. So. As a result, I'm very conservative in what I do. This one here, it's like painting a wet noodle, okay? It's four feet long, and it's this wide. And it's got holes in it. It's not like a solid piece of stock. Hold on. See, your box from Sailgate came in. Why, thank you. Don't you love Alexis? Don't you love Alexa? Got it scattered between my office, my shops, and, and the house. Now the wife can find me everywhere. Anyway. I don't own this. And I can't, like Stephen Foster, go out in the back and pour a new one. You know, he goes and makes them they're at a shop and sells them. So I'm very conservative. I don't want to hurt this. So I take light cuts and I don't need it to be clamped down so solidly that it's bending the metal. And that, that does happen. So right now it's pretty tight in there and I'm going to take off this outer skin and then put it in the, the heat uh, treating oven to stress relieve it and then it'll come back on here and we're just going to take small cuts because when I'm through between here and there you shouldn't be able to put a cigarette paper which is thousands of an inch thick so people say my that caster said my my, my holding was crappy well, it would be if I was going to take a lot of metal off, but I'm trying to do this with finesse. I've got this quarter inch thick six by six bolted to the table. I have little screws on the inside that can help me align this back and forth. And then I have three uh, bolts going in the side holding it to it. In addition, I have a stop clamp down here, and I was just getting ready to see about putting a, 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 a fixture down here to hold it down. Because on this one, when it hits here, that's where the force tries to make it go up. 
I don't need it right now. Well, I might. Just have to see here. We'll give it a shot. I just want to get this skinned off. Now, when I line it up, I take and put my level here. And I take a square. Remember, I've already planed these edges. And so I line it up here. Then, go back to the old school. This is not so old school. Pakistani truck, this is all they use. But you can take your surface scribe and I go along and I see what's going along down. You'll notice it's higher on this side. It's touching and this side it's not. That's because the draft of this goes this way. Uh, when you pull it out of the mold, they'll pull it out this way. So it's thicker here than it is down here. And what I want is consistency all the way down. And this little gauge right here is a very helpful tool for finding that. I'm looking good. Now, when you're playing it, you want to make sure everything is tight. Get all your tools off of it. I think we're ready to go. You see a problem? I've got to raise this up so this all clears. Now, this is a 1943 planer. This 1943 planer, while it's old by our standards in 2021, this was one of the last modern planers they made. It doesn't have belts, it has a hydraulic pump in the back, uh, 20 horsepower motor on it, and everything on here is run by hydraulics, except for the motor up on top, which raises uh, the column up and does fast feeds on all of the uh, heads. So what I gotta do is unclamp the column or the head from the column and raise it up about a foot. Now this machine, I have it loose there. Loose here. It's got about six bolts going up and down. And then you have to go back in the back. I have two clamps. Right. I have two clamps right there. Get away from that spider. Boy, the spider's just moving in. And then I have two clamps back here that I've already released. So now we're ready to go up. Turn on some power. 20 horsepower rotary phase converter. Control box is mounted on the wall. The motor's actually out in the back of the shop in a doghouse. All right, let's see. You've got to raise up these two buttons here. Use this lever. This is about midway of its travel. That's pretty close. So now we clamp it down.
I always leave my wrench up here on this bolt to remind me to unclamp it. And I guess the reason being is somebody at one time forgot to unclamp it when they lifted it and they broke where that shaft attaches. Nice job of fixing it. Still. Yeah. Go back over here. There's the war production tag on it. Pull this down, this down. And that claps the back of it off, I guess. Put a little apron on. When you're planing or machine and cast iron of any kind it kind of gritty. It's on your clothes pretty bad. All right, we're going to start it up. more noise on a return time because the flood is because the uh, air is in out of all the little cylinders and things usually I let it run for about 20 minutes warming up when I'm doing the the final cut something like this though I don't really care so much because this is just rough cutting getting that bad surface off so I can get it in the stress relieving. See, it's already quieter. It's got a huge cylinder underneath it. You see down here on the ways to the oil. The pump is also pumping oil into the ways. And you see how it drips off into the center trough and comes back and returns. All right, let's make some chips. you got to do is make sure you keep up with your bevel. You see here the bevel's gone. You still got a little bit tearing there. But if I don't do that, it'll start tearing out metal along the edge like that did. So, got to find me a, a longer cord for these things. See, this one's fine down here. Down here needs a touch up.
I don't know because I stopped for sure 100% where this tool is touching this. So whenever I start back, I pull it off to the side and then I speed into it at the same setting. So no. Call me a big crazy cat. I don't care. I'm actually throwing one of these across the room. Getting it down, trying to make, we got full contact here, full surface over here, it's low in the middle. There's this little dip right here that's concerning me a little bit. It's very hard right along the edge. And the reason I can tell you, and I know it's hard right there, get this camera flipped around. See how shiny it is right there? It's hitting that and it's a hard surface. So I need to get that out. And I took a test cut over here and that's about the level that that'll be at when I'm through. If it's just a little bit left, that's okay. I'm, there's another hard spot right there. It'll I'm, be okay. It'll be okay. Basically what I'm doing is getting all the stuff that doesn't look like a straight edge out of the way, the rough stuff. I'm using a roughing bit, you know. If this was a, a regular piece of steel or something, I would get underneath all this crap on top. But I can't go down that deep and take a cut without taking a chance of throwing this off the machine or or, or breaking and cracking one of the ribs. So, have to go easy. I use a, a, a bit that we worked on. Gary, my friend, machinist, helped a lot on that, designing that bit cut. He, he must have sharpened it 30 times trying to get it to where it would stand up and still get through all this junk here. Then I go to a finished one. But this right here, we're going to continue on down until all this is gone and then I'm going to take it off and put it in the, the stress relieving oven and people tell me and we've had this argument for years this was supposed to be stress relieved and people say well once it's stress relieved it's stress relieved and there is no more stress in it well, my argument is it depends on who stress relieved it and how they stress relieved it. I've seen these things come to me and I do this and finish playing them and they look really good. And then the next day I come out here and they're off two thousands. There's internal stresses in all this metal. I use a four foot long heat treating oven and take this to the United States Navy recommended temperatures to stress relief cast iron it's always had a battle you know they used to say well we leave our castings outside for 10 years they're naturally stress relief or we ring them or we take it to 400 degrees or we do this or all kinds of witches magic potions as far as I know, the, the U.S. Navy was the first one to do a study to actually test all those methods. I'll, I'll put a link in the description to that paper on it. And they say, I'm getting old so my memory's kind of off, and my heat stress relief oven is, I programmed it years ago and it's already set in there, but they were saying that, I believe it's 1,050 degrees, 
this has to be brought up to temperature to that temperature and then one hour for every inch of cross section and then slowly step it down well i programmed mine to where it does all that i throw it in there and walk away that was the only stress relieving technique that they found to be effective and so you know it's like taking your car to the car dealer who knows what they really did to it you know they may have thrown it into an oven and left it in there and it comes out and it's kind of tarnished say hey that's good enough it's only when you get to this point of trying to make it into a fine instrument that you find out it's not good enough so that's the way I do it not saying it's the right way just saying this is the way I do it let's finish <laughs> Get spots like that. I'm going to come back over in the reverse direction like a spring pass. That's the hard spot. Miss this huge clapper box up in the air a little bit. easy to change directions on this all I have to do is move this gear to the other position now that gear there uh, the shaft turns it and start bringing it back Here's where we get into the decision time. This is just a little bit of hard stuff on top. And this is about a 20 or 30 thousandths deep hole. Does that hole hurt this usability of this in any way? Nope. It is so small compared to the rest of the surface area, you'd never notice it. But dead gummit, you spend this much money for a casting and, and, and the money and time and effort to plane it and then ship it around the country and then you got to sit there and hand scrape it. I like for it to look as good as possible. So I'm going to take it down until that spot disappears with my roughing tool. 
And the reason I'm doing that is because that spot around the edges has got white cast iron steel and it was chilled when it hit that. And every time my razor sharp blade or, or every time my newly sharpened finished blade goes past that sucker, it's going to affect it. It may jump up a little bit or whatever. I want to try to start off with the same density of cast iron everywhere. That's a hard spot. This is a really heavy clapper box, but it'll still jump up when it hits that. So I've got a little bit more work to do to get to there. But luckily, it's disappearing at the same time this hump in here is. So even though it's just a little bit deeper, I'm thinking that almost all would go out of here and still have a good use, good edge. I, uh, chamfer is gone on that end again. You go quick.